Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. While you're standing, let's go ahead and pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for this time together. Lord, we're thankful for friends that support, love, and encourage one another. And Lord, tonight we're thankful for the Word of God. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit, our teacher. We're thankful for time to be able to, to focus and draw closer to you and draw from your presence and your power and your ability to help us in our lives. And Lord, tonight we thank you that you're going to teach us, you're going to challenge us, you're going to instruct us, you're going to make us better because of having been with you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. Uh, it is always uh, a real treat to be here. Uh, absolutely love and appreciate Pastor Jim and Deborah and Pastor Dan and Jess and Pastor Luke and Stacy. Just the whole team here, uh, all of the people that are a part of leading and working, serving. Uh, this is, and I don't say this in a flattery, superficial way, but this really is one of the premier churches in the country. And uh, I appreciate what you all are doing, the way you care for people, you minister to people's needs. Uh, you are, are really a bright, bright light, and I appreciate that so much. What, what I'm going to share with you tonight is, uh, is something that I feel like I have been personally challenged with. Uh, how many of you know God wants us to grow? And, and growth always involves change. And change means that we have to expand some of the ways we think. How many of you know that growth means that sometimes we have to get a little bit uncomfortable? We have to get outside of some of our comfort zones. But, but after God has expanded us and stretched us and enabled us to be something more than we ever were before, isn't that a great sense of fulfillment uh, when we've been able to grow in Him? And one of the things I love about God is that He does meet us where we are. He meets us at our point of need. And how many of you know we have different needs at different phases of life? And if we're facing a real, you know, critical, uh, tremendous difficulty in life, and, and God helps us to survive, uh, then we become survivors how many of you, God's brought you out of something that you wondered if you would ever make it out of? You wondered if there was going to be a tomorrow. You wondered if there was going to be hope in the future. And, and God brought you out of that. And God helped you survive. And when he does that for us, we become survivors. Aren't you thankful for what God has helped you to survive? What he has helped you to come through? But sometimes we, we are in other situations where uh, we, we begin to see that, you know what, God, I, I have more potential than just to survive. Uh, I, God, I believe you can help me succeed. And when, when God helps us succeed, we become successful. How many of you has God helped you to achieve something? Uh, to move into a realm of overflow, abundance, uh, form of prosperity where, uh, you know, you had enough and then to share. Uh, how many of you, God has helped you succeed at something? When God helps us survive, we become survivors. When God helps us succeed, we become successful. And of course, on both of those, we can and should be very thankful uh, for what God does to help us. But you know what? When, when God works in us, when God works through us to help someone else survive, when God works in us and through us to help somebody else succeed, then we become significant. Now, we have an intrinsic value before God just because he made us and because he loves us. Uh, we are significant to God 
just simply because he has set his love and affection on us. But isn't it awesome when we have the opportunity to let God work through us so that somebody else can survive and somebody else can succeed? And then we know that we've become significant, not just to God because of our intrinsic value, but we've become significant because of what we've allowed God to do through us to be a blessing to other people. Say this, I don't just want to survive. I don't just want to be successful. I want to be significant. And the best way we can ever be significant is not just in our own fleshly human attempts and our fleshly efforts, but one of the greatest ways, really the ultimate way to be significant is to let God himself work through us, to express himself through us. I, I want to share a, a video clip with you, but I need to maybe do a little bit of explanation here. Uh, how many people here tonight are under the age of 25? Let me see your hand if you're here. And you're under the age of 25. There's a, there's a number of people here. Um, probably if you're around 20 to 25, you're going to be okay with the video clip I'm going to share. If you're younger than that, you might need some, a little bit of, of explanation, uh, coaching, tutoring. Uh, this is going to be a transgenerational message, all right? So let's go ahead if we can. Let's roll the video clip, and then I'll explain uh, some elements of this video clip after we've watched it. Let's go ahead and roll that. If you'd like to hear Ella Fitzgerald's voice crystal clear, you'll record on new Memorex MRX3 cassette tape. It reproduces live sound with such crystal clear fidelity, you'll have to ask, is it Ella or is it MRX3? Is it live or is it Memorex? Now, how many of you folks are up in the neighborhood of my age and you remember that commercial? Let me see your hand. That commercial, I had to check it out, but that commercial was shown in 1974. And if you're real young here and you don't know what, what is a cassette tape, because how many of you know things change, you know, really quickly? And uh, there, you know, some real young people might really seriously not know what a cassette tape is. I'm holding in my hand a cassette tape. <laughs> Shortly after the discovery of electricity, cassette tapes came along. That's just a very condensed version of history. Today, you know, a lot of people have CDs, but did you know that CDs are kind of heading toward becoming obsolete, perhaps? They're still very prevalent, but, you know, probably give another decade or so, and probably nobody will know what a CD is. Uh, today, you know, so many of the young people, I have a, an iPod, an MP3 player, that's about the size maybe of a 50-cent piece, but square, maybe a quarter and it's square, and it will hold thousands of songs and messages and things of that nature. Uh, this cassette tape that I'm holding, uh, you know, an older technology, uh, you could put a whole sermon on this, all right? Uh, this doesn't hold nearly as much as what our modern digital technology holds. But the point of that whole commercial is Ella Fitzgerald was a very famous singer, and apparently, I'm not a music person, so if I don't explain this right, forgive me. But apparently, she had such a range in her singing that she could hit a note so high that she could shatter glass. She could shatter a goblet. And what Memorex, the company, was saying, because they were very proud of their new cassette tape, they were saying that when she sang... It obviously had that perfect clarity to it, but what they were saying is if you recorded her voice 
on a cassette tape and then played the music on the cassette that the, and these are the two words I want you to get tonight, reproduction quality. Everybody say that, reproduction quality. They were saying that the reproduction quality of her voice being played on the tape was so accurately reflected and represented her personal quality that, that it was essentially indistinguishable that you couldn't tell the quality on the tape from the quality of the voice coming from her personally. That's the purpose. That was the um, intention of that, that particular commercial. It was all about reproduction quality. I want to talk to you tonight about the fact that every single one of us was designed by God to have a certain level of reproduction quality. That we were put on this earth to, I don't want to try to reduce us to being just a cassette tape or something like that because it's more involved than that. But if you can imagine for a moment what the, very, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God ordained that in a sense that we be a, a reproduction of him. That we embody his character, his dignity, his glory, his uh, magnificence, that we would somehow through reproduction being created by God that he would so create us in his image and in his likeness that we would be able to reflect him and accurately represent him, that we would have reproduction quality in our own life. How many of you know that deal didn't work out very good? And it didn't work out badly because God was not a good planner or because God was somehow uh, ineffective or inefficient. The plan broke down because man broke image from God. Instead of following God and obeying God and doing uh, those things that would have caused us to maintain a vibrant relationship with God where his life would be continually flowing into us so that we would be able to uh, progressively reflect him and continue to have that reproduction quality. In other words, living out the very image and likeness of God from our lives. Man broke relationship with God. Man chose to obey Satan. Man disobeyed God. Man decided to do his own thing. And man, in essence, said, God, I'm not going to reproduce your quality anymore. And man, through sin, through spiritual death, actually entered into a relationship of sorts with Satan. And from the very onset, man began to reproduce upon the earth not the nature of God, but the nature of Satan. Man's, Adam's first son, Cain, became a murderer, murdered Adam and Eve's second son, Abel. And from that time forward, mankind has just been in a, in a death spiral and so many of the things that we see coming out of humans today, the things that we see coming out of mankind today, it is reproduction quality, but it's not reproducing the nature of God. It's reproducing sin. It's reproducing violence. It's reproducing 
hatred and jealousy and animosity and selfishness. And that is why we see so much evil in the world. Is because man was designed to reproduce God's nature. But when man broke relationship with God, we began to reproduce everything except God's nature. But aren't you glad that God made a way for us to get back into relationship with Him? God sent Jesus to the earth. And Jesus took the penalty, took the punishment, took the shame, took the guilt, took the condemnation. Jesus went to the cross, shed His blood, died for our sins, rose from the dead... And he says to everybody, do you want a new life? Do you want a new beginning? Do you want a new start? Do you want to quit reproducing the garbage of hell? And do you want to get reconnected with God and begin to reproduce the life and the nature of God in the earth? And that's where everyone stands today. Most of us in this room tonight, most of us have made that decision and we've realized, you know what, on my old cassette tape, I had a bunch of garbage. Aren't you glad that God has an erase button? And we were able to get the past erased and now we're able to get something new and we're able to absorb it through what we might call the renewing of the mind and spiritual growth and spiritual maturity and so on. And we're able to begin to reproduce the quality of God in the earth. See, there's four things that God wants for every person. Number one, God wants us to be spirit born. Born of the spirit. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see and you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. How many of you know what it is to be born again? Let me see your hand. You know what it is to recognize, you know what, my old life wasn't what it needed to be. My old life had a bunch of chains, had a bunch of bondage. Uh, I was full of, of guilt. I was full of, of shame. I was full of condemnation because I'm just part of the human race. And the Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And somebody told us that, that glorious, wonderful news that Jesus died so that we could have a new life and that Jesus was raised from the dead and that he offered us that amazing, wonderful gift of righteousness and that we could come to Jesus and give him all of our life and all of our heart and we could get a brand new beginning, a brand new start and we could get totally set free from all the junk of the past. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. God's plan is not just that we get spirit born, born of the spirit. When we get born of the spirit, that's not the finish line. That's the beginning point. Because once we get spirit born, God wants us to get spirit filled. God wants us to be uh, saturated with his presence, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then God wants us to become spirit-led. He wants us to learn how to be led and governed and directed by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the Holy Spirit will help us in our decision-making? The Holy Spirit will guide us about things that are the right things to do, the healthy things to do, the pr productive things to do. And the Holy Spirit will he'll teach us all things, Jesus said. He'll show us things to come. God wants us to be spirit-born, spirit-filled, spirit-led. And even that's not the end. God wants us to be spirit-formed where the Holy Spirit works within us to mature us, to develop our character, to develop our values, to create within us mature godliness. Say this out loud with me. God wants every person 
to be spirit born, to be spirit filled, to be spirit led, and to be spirit formed. Now, if you've already become spirit born, then you recognize, you know, those are certain signposts of spiritual growth and maturity. How many of you are a work in progress? Let me see your hand. God's not finished with any one of us yet. We're still, you know, the Bible talks about being continually filled with the Spirit. It's a progressive experiential element in our walk with God. Uh, the fact that you were led by the Spirit yesterday doesn't mean that you don't need to be led by the Spirit tomorrow. He's there to guide us uh, for the fullness of our days. And we are continually undergoing spiritual formation in our lives because we're continually growing, maturing, and developing. So what happens when we are allowing that process to really take place in our life? We've been spirit-born. We're being filled with the Spirit. We're being led by the Spirit. We're being formed by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.1 in the Amplified is a very, very fascinating verse. In the Amplified Bible, Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God. Copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their father. Can you believe that the Apostle Paul told us to do that? Does that sound a little bit challenging, a little bit difficult? I mean, what would you do if you walked into church and one of your friends is there and said, Hey, what you been doing this week? And they said... Oh, just imitating God. But you know, that's what the Bible says we're, we're supposed to do. What did that cassette tape do that when it was recording Ella Fitzgerald's voice? What that cassette tape did was it imitated her. It copied her. It followed her example. It, it brought reproduction quality onto the tape from the live voice. When you and I set our hearts to enjoy being spirit-born, spirit-filled, spirit-led, and spirit-formed, do you know what? God is reproducing His nature and His qualities on the inside of us. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing. You will never do Ephesians 5, 1, from the outside in. You cannot do it. I mean, what, what would happen if I said, okay, I want you, start acting like God. Just start acting like God right now. What are you going to do? But if this is something that comes from within, something that is divinely energized by His presence from the inside of us. So this isn't just something you can do with sheer willpower or sheer determination. This is something that we do by yielding ourselves to the one who is alive on the inside of us. We yield. We surrender. As a matter of fact, the whole process of spiritual growth is not about some kind of external conformity. It's about inward transformation. Amen. There's a powerful verse in Luke chapter 6, verse 40, where Jesus said, he said in Luke 6, 40, a disciple. How many of you consider yourselves to be a disciple? You know what a disciple is? A disciple is a student, a learner, a follower. Jesus said a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is perfectly trained, everybody who has been fully and completely through the training process, everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. See, 
that's not exactly what we would say in our Western society because our Western educational system is based more on the Greek model of education, which is based, to put this very simplistically, is based on lecturing, transmitting information so that the student can regurgitate the information on a test and get a good grade. How many of you have been through school? How many of you, like me, have at times studied the material just to remember it long enough to be able to answer the right questions on the test and as soon as the test was over, I mean within hours, you had no idea what any of that stuff was really about. Because one of the, the flaws of, of a certain form of education is that it is relegated to the limitation of transmission of information. Thank God for information. Information is good. And I'm not trying to be totally negative or critical. It probably sounds like I am. I'm really not. But I am saying this. There was another model of education that Jesus was coming from. Jesus wasn't referring to a Greek or Western model of education. Jesus was from a Jewish background. And he was speaking of the educational process that was more practiced in the East. And see, Jesus said that when you have been fully taught by your teacher, he didn't say you will know what your teacher knows. He said you'll be like your teacher. Our goal in coming to church, studying the Bible, being a part of fellowship groups, our goal is not to simply get a bunch of information in our head. Our goal is not the transmission of information so much as the transformation of character. When you come to church, when you go to Bible class, when you do whatever you do to, to absorb for spiritual benefit, don't be content with the accumulation, the mere accumulation of intellectual information. Don't be satisfied until you begin to experience what Jesus said, and he said that when we have been fully trained by him, when we have been fully taught by him, Jesus said, you will be like your teacher. Our goal in learning, growing, maturing is not simply the transmission of information but the transformation of our character. I want to be like Jesus. Just like that cassette tape captured Ella Fitzgerald. We are to capture the life, nature, character of Jesus so that reproduction quality has happened. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Are you getting anything out of this tonight? Romans chapter 8, verse 29 tells us that God's plan from the very beginning was that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Conformed to the image of Christ. The Amplified Bible says it this way, Romans 8, 29. He also destined from the beginning, foreordaining them. Do you know God had a plan for your life before you were ever born? Foreordaining them. He destined you from the very beginning, foreordaining you, them, to be molded. Everybody say molded into the image of his son and share inwardly his likeness. What are we reproducing? 
Do you ever sing that song? I, it's, I don't think it's popular anymore, but people used to sing it several years ago. I've got something on the inside. It's working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. When Paul went through the, the works of the flesh, you know, he talked about all these things about, you know, immorality, adultery, uh, wrath, strife, envy, all these different things. See, those are not the things a believer is supposed to be reproducing because we are supposed to re be reproducing the life and the nature of God that is on the inside of us. We really are, and the reason that we, it's so vital that we reproduce the qualities of God in our life is because of who he called us to be in the earth. We're his representatives. We're his ambassadors. We are, we are to be an expression of God's nature, God's kindness, God's compassion, God's long-suffering, God's loving kindness. We, we are to be an expression of God in the earth. And I like to say it this way. Others have said this, that we are the only Bible that some people will ever read. That we are the only Jesus that some people will ever see. Are we accurately representing? You know, Memorex made the boast that, man, you can't tell the difference between the reproduction quality versus the real thing. My question is, are we as believers accurately reproducing the qualities, the nature, the character of God in the earth? A couple scriptures here. John chapter 20 and verse 21. See, this is why I say that this has been a challenge to me. If this is coming across as a challenge to you, it, it's probably because this has been a challenge to me. What, what am I emanating? What am I exuding? What's, what's coming out of me? What's showing from me? There was a little girl that was riding home from church with her mom and dad and little brother, and she said, Mom, the preacher said today that God is bigger than anything and everything. Is that true? And the mom said, well, yeah, honey, that's true. God is bigger than anything and everything. And she said, and mom, the preacher also said that God lives inside of us. Is that true? And the mom said, well, yeah, that's true too. And the little girl was a little bit confused. She said, well, mom, if God is bigger than anything and everything and he lives in us, shouldn't he be showing through Don't ever argue with a child. But here's what Jesus said in John chapter 20 and verse 21. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Was Jesus on a mission? Then are we on a mission? Did Jesus have an assignment? then we have an assignment. Did Jesus have a purpose? Then we have a purpose. Did Jesus have a destiny? Then we have a destiny. Did Jesus have a mandate? Then we have a mandate. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. We're called to be the cassette tape that accurately reproduces him and reflects him. If we're going to be like Jesus, I mean, there are hundreds of things we could talk about. Let me just share one of them. John chapter 9, verse 4. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Two things about Jesus. Number one, to Jesus, work was not an option. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me. And really for a believer who is accurately reproducing Jesus, we're going to have that same sense of, I'm here to do something for God. 
And even more accurately, I'm here to let God do something through me. That's really more accurate. Because Jesus, when he talked about the works he did, he said, the works that I do, it's not really me, it's the Father in me doing the works. And that, again, is why I want to stress, when it comes to reproducing God in the earth, it's not something we can do from the outside in. It's not something we can do through sheer willpower or determination. It's something that happens when our life is surrendered to God. When we are yielded to God and we allow Him to do His work through us. Because if we did it, then we'd take the credit for it. But if we have the understanding that Jesus had, that Paul had and all that, that Jesus said, I can't do anything of myself. Jesus understood that he lived in complete reliance and dependence and obedience to God. And then God did it through him. But Jesus had this attitude of that works were an, uh, not, not a, a, a burdensome chore obligation, but, but that it was, a, it was something that was an imperative to him. I must work the works of him that sent me. And notice what Jesus said. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Jesus had a sense of urgency based on time. I'm not here tonight to teach eschatology. I don't know when the final days are, but I'm going to tell you what, this is somebody's final day. Somebody's, you know, we, we don't know when different folks are going to be leaving this earth and and we need to seize the opportunity. That's what Jesus was saying. Don't, don't put this thing off. Work while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So let's, let's seize the moment. Let's redeem the time. Let's not let opportunities pass us by. Let's strike while the iron is hot. We don't know when certain people are no longer going to be here and we won't even have an opportunity to reach them. Let's, let's do it now. That's how Jesus operated. And I want to close with two final verses. Paul, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Whoa. I was looking at my notes. Really, I meant to do that. I wanted to come down and be closer to everybody. <laughs> Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. These two verses we're about to look at are so crucial to what we're talking about. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's not just that we get a new life. It's that we die to the old life. And Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What an amazing, what an amazing statement. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I, I took, my wife and I took our kids skiing uh, several years ago, and I just did not like it. My kids both took to it like that. I mean, they were like fish in the water, and I just kept falling down and rolling down the hill, and my kids kept laughing at me, and I just wasn't very good. And... Uh, I just didn't have the determination, oh, I'm going to stick in here until I learn how to do it. Man, there was a fire in the lodge. There was hot chocolate in the lodge. <laughs> it was just so easy to not put forth the effort to learn how to do that. But what if, what if somehow the greatest skier in the world, and I know I'm talking hypothetical stuff here, but what if somehow the greatest skier in the world could have somehow come and inhabited my body? And all I had to do was to yield to his ability on the inside of me. I just had to cooperate 
and really let him ski through me. Wouldn't that have been awesome? Now, I know we can't do that when it comes to skiing and other things, but you know what? When it comes to our walk with God, that is exactly what we do. We come to the place where we say, God, I can't do it. I mean, I've been crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. I, the, the old man is dead. Nevertheless, I live, but it's not me. It's Christ living in me. See, that's the reproduction quality. Let me share with you one final verse, and we'll close with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul says... But by the grace of God. How many of you here tonight are thankful for grace? Yes. Thankful for grace. Where would we be if God were not gracious to us? If God were not merciful, compassionate, loving? Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And do you know why that statement is so powerful? Before... He became Paul the Apostle. He went by another name, Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus was a man full of hate. He was a man full of really anger. He was hostile. He took part in the death of the first Christian martyr, Stephen. He held the coats of those that stoned Stephen to death. And he got authority from the appropriate authorities and went from city to city to persecute Christians and throw people in jail for one reason and one reason only, because they believed in Jesus Christ. By every modern-day definition, Saul of Tarsus, the man who became Paul the Apostle, was a terrorist. But he knew that God had changed his life. He knew that what he had been reproducing was not the right stuff. But he came to Jesus, or might even say it this way, Jesus came to him. And he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain but I labored more abundantly than they all. He, he cooperated with the grace of God. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I believe, and I don't know about you, I, I'm not here tonight because I'm perfect in what I'm preaching you, to you. I'm, I'm sharing what I'm sharing with you tonight because it's something that I'm growing in personally. And I'm not everything I will be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. God can change us. And there are people here tonight that you've had all kinds of, in the past, you've had all kinds of things put onto the cassette tape of your life. All kinds of pain and rejection and you know, things that have been done to you, things that you have done. And thank God he's able to erase and he's able to re-record and he's able to create in you, making you somebody you could have never been without him, Amen. enabling you to do things you could have never done without his work on the inside of your life. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for this church. I want to thank you for these believers. I want to thank you for the growth and the progress that has taken place in everybody's life. I want to thank you, Father, for those that have been enjoying the new birth and being spirit-filled and spirit-led and spirit-formed. And Father, I'm praying right now for individuals here tonight that, that first of all, that need to just really be reminded of their purpose, that, God, we're not just here to survive, and we're not just here to succeed, but, Lord, we're here to help others survive and succeed, and that helps us to be significant. 
And Father, for those believers that are here, I pray that you'll just birth within them a great desire to have reproduction quality in their own life, to really manifest the life and nature of God, that through the new birth we can reclaim what once was lost and now we can say, once again, I'm living in and living out the image and the likeness of God. Father, I pray that will be a reality for so many tonight. But Lord, I want to pray right now for individuals that, that may not know you, that may not have a relationship with you. Lord, there are people here tonight that maybe have gotten off track. Maybe they knew you at one time, but they turned away and went another direction. Maybe they've been reproducing a lot of ungodly things in their life. Or maybe they just haven't been bearing any fruit for you because they haven't really been vitally connected to the vine. And Lord, there may be individuals here tonight that have never established a relationship with you. And I pray that tonight will be a, a night of new beginnings for them. That this will be the night when, when that junk on their tape is erased. And Lord, you begin to put a new song on their tape. You begin to put new life on their tape. You, you begin to uh, lead them on a journey of being spirit-born and spirit-filled and spirit-led and spirit-formed. I, I want to just talk to you for a minute. If you're here tonight and you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior tonight, I want to pray for you because I don't want you to miss out on the most wonderful opportunity of your life. Listen, this world is filled with so much garbage, darkness, junk. The Bible says that everybody has sinned. Everybody has come short of the glory of God. So there's nobody here tonight looking judgmentally at anybody. If, if we're here tonight and we have hope and we have joy and we have confidence and we have assurance, it's not because of how perfect we are. It's about how wonderful God has been to us. And I want you to know tonight, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the night to get off of the path that you've been on, a path of hopelessness, a path of purposelessness, a path that ultimately ends up in, in death and in hell. God loves us so much. He sent Jesus so that if we believe on him, we would never perish, but we would have the gift of eternal life. I want to pray for folks tonight, and I specifically want to pray for two groups of people. Number one, I want to pray for you if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. If you'd say, Tony, I don't know that I've ever given my life to God. I'm not talking about you being religious. I'm not talking about you having a mental belief in God. That's not enough. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about you giving all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, trusting Him, trusting in His death, trusting in His blood for your forgiveness and for you to have that brand new start that comes from being a new creature in Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus, I'm talking to you. If you have accepted the Lord at some point in your life, but you know that you've gotten away from God and you know that you're not living for God right here and now and you haven't been, but tonight you need to go on record. And, and one of the reasons why it's just important to make a public profession of faith is Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before God. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before God. And this, this is a safe and a friendly place where when you make that decision for Jesus for the very first time or you rededicate your life to God, man, everybody's going to celebrate with you. You don't have to come in the side door. You get to come in the front door because you're first class with God. You're important to Him. You're valuable to Him. And in just a minute, I'm going to ask you uh, that if that's you, you need Jesus for the first time, you need to rededicate your life to God, I'm going to ask you to do two very simple things. I'm going to ask you to just hold your hand up real high. 
just so I'll know that that's you, that you mean business with God. And I'm going to ask you just to come and stand with me. Let me shake your hand. Let me say, you know, hello and we love you. And let's pray together right here. On the count of three, if you need Jesus for the first time, you need to rededicate your life to God, I want you to shoot your hand up real high. One, two, three. Let me see your hand all over this place. Thank you. There's one. There's two. There's three. I'm looking all over this place. Thank you. There's four. There's five. I'm continuing to look. Let me see your hand if that's you. You mean business with God. You need Jesus tonight for the very first time. You need to rededicate your life to God. Here's what we're going to do. I want everybody to stand up. I want those five individuals. I saw your hand. I want you to make your way down here right now. But the, the people that are here in the, in this, that are standing, I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to say, hey, do you need to walk down there? Do you need to get right with God tonight? I'll walk down there with you. Go ahead and do that. And thank God for these that are coming. Jesus, I believe. What's your name? I'm so glad you came. And you. God bless you. I'm so glad Jesus, you came. Jesus, I you. belong. I'm so glad you came. God bless you. To you. I'm so glad you You're came. You're the reason God that bless you. I live. You. You're the reason God bless you. that so glad I you came. breathe. God bless you. Jesus, I believe. God bless you. So glad you came. God bless you. Thank you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Amen. Listen, guys, I want you to know this. Nobody came down here because of me. You came down here because 2,000 years ago, somebody loved you enough to die on a cross for you. His name is Jesus. And he said, listen to what he said. He said, whoever comes to me, I will never turn them away. I'll never reject them. I'll never cast them out. And so as you come to Jesus tonight, man, he, he's, he's there to embrace you and receive you. And here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And then this guy right here, he's got to be a great guy because his name is Tony also. So I know he's an awesome guy. But he's going to take you. He's going to make sure you have a Bible. He's going to make sure you've got some good materials in your hand to help you in your spiritual journey. Say this with me from your heart. Say, Dear God, I come to you right now, and I thank you for Jesus. Even though we've all sinned, and we all need your forgiveness, Jesus died so that we could be forgiven. Jesus, I accept you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I turn away from my old life and I come to you face to face to begin a brand new life. Thank you that you cleanse me. Thank you that you forgive me. Thank you that you make me a brand new person tonight and that you give me a brand new start. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you turn right over here to Tony and would you just follow him? He's going to get you lined up on some great things tonight. Let's give them a hand as they go. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known 
in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.